Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Great. You know, I have to say it. I am just a pilot. Just a pilot. And I'll go into that for a minute. But when I, have you guys seen all the people that are going to be here in their biographies and their autobiographies and everything? I'm only four pages away from an astronaut. <laughs> and I'm going to, if my mom was alive, I'd send this to her. Thank you very much for attending. It's good to see you almost a full house. I'll try to keep you amused. Golden opportunity for a HEMS industry in crisis. Who's a helicopter EMS pilot here or involved in some way? Yeah. Do you all know that it's the most dangerous job in America? Did you know that? No? Did you know that? It is. Officially the most job in America, uh, most dangerous job in America. And it was the most dangerous job when I did it 34 years ago, when I was one of the pioneers in helicopter EMS and we were trying to prove the concept. And I've been watching for the past 34 years. I've been out of America, out of North America for 28 years, exposed to a new paradigm and a new way of doing things that I, on the 31st of August, 2010, became an activist for change. I couldn't handle seeing all the death that I was seeing in America. And that is the date I became an activist to try to make a difference. Go back to North America and say, look, you're doing it wrong. You're killing people. Here's how you do it. And then I was just going to walk off the stage and let them get on with it. So I'm going to take you on a journey today so that you can see through my eyes what I've witnessed for the past 34 years to allow me to come up to this idea of how can one man make a change in an industry that is deadly and doesn't seem to want to change. 
Now, I said I was just a pilot. You probably heard this, didn't you, about the just a pilot? When I was an air medical pilot at uh, UCSD Medical Center in San Diego in 1980, this was, I'd been in air medical flying for one year. And um, we'd go on what's called public relations flights, where we would go to first responders and teach them how to set up landing sites, or we'd go to hospitals and teach them how to use us, how to call us, when to call us. And we had these really cool flight suits from Flight Suits Limited. You know, we looked like blue angels, you know. They took measurements on me I didn't even know I had. Do you dress left or right? Uh, I didn't know what they were talking about. Maybe neither, <laughs> you don't either. But anyway, they took like about 134 measurements and we look cool. We look cool standing there. And they'd go up to the doctor, they'd ask him questions. They'd go up to the flight nurse, they'd ask her a question. They'd come up to me and they say, this is what they said, are you medical, medically qualified or are you just the pilot? Well, yeah, I'm just the pilot. I'm the guy that you wake up at 2.30 in the morning on the second day of my 48-hour shift. It's 2.30 in the morning. You tell me that there's, you know, two dead, uh, head injury. Uh, you've got a baby on scene that needs uh, um, immediate attention. And I can't figure out which shoe to put on what foot. And then I fly marginal VFR with the doctor and nurse on board who are half asleep. I get them to the scene, they stabilize the patients, and then I fly back to the hospital. I get them back safe, yeah, I'm just the pilot. So I wanted, I was tired of them asking me if I'm just the pilot. So I, I found out something. I noticed that around hospitals, there's a lot of really smart people. And you ever notice that when somebody is really smart, uh, they have a long title? And so I figured I need a, a long title because if I had a long title on my name tag, nobody asked me, I'm just a pilot anymore. So I came up with four titles and I ran them by the flight nurses and they, we all agreed on one title. And they said, yeah, you have that title. Nobody will ever, ever ask you if you're just a pilot anymore. So I made this title up and honest to God, at, for the rest of the five years I was at UCSD Medical Center in San Diego, nobody ever again asked me if I was just the pilot because I was Randy Maines, the Emergency Medical Vertical Levitation Practitioner. <laughs> okay. Aeromedical flying in the States is, has officially been termed the most dangerous job in America. NTSB report points to helicopter EMS crew as the highest risk occupation. 2013 is starting off very bad for the HEMS industry. And in fact, it, it's on par or worse, with, worse than 2008, which was the worst year on record. Lad Sanger is representing four of the victims from the Cromwell crash. He is also a licensed helicopter pilot. He says the crew sometimes put themselves in danger because they feel a pressing need to fly. That's in addition to the competitive nature of the business and equipment issues that all lead to the high number of accidents. These are the same problems I witnessed when I started flying air medical um, helicopters out of Herman Hospital in January 1979. Things haven't changed. And watching from outside of America, which I'll go into on this journey I'm going to take you on, it's, it's like if you want to trap a baboon in Kenya, you know how you do it? You find a stump and you put a hole in it and you put some food in there and the baboon goes up and grabs it. And then you walk up and you capture the baboon because it doesn't want to let it go. That's what happens in America. They don't want to pay the money to outfit the helicopters to make it safe for these people that are going inadvertently in the clouds and killing themselves. They would rather look at the bottom line. That's the stark reality. So I'm gonna tell you a story of my first 
mission that I got to see helicopter EMS in action. You know what EMS stands for? Emergency Medical Services, Air Ambulance. I was 21, 21 years old, and it was a mission to fly. We were two UH-1 helicopters, the Huey, and it was supposed to be a piece of cake mission. You ever hear of a piece of cake? Hey, this is going to be a piece of cake. I don't want to hear that. Whenever I hear something's going to be a piece of cake, it usually turns out to be a lot less than that. I'd rather hear this is going to be a tough mission than I'm not going to be disappointed if it's not. So anyway, yeah, this is going to be a piece of cake. So I was going to have four recon team members in my helicopter, and Warrant Officer Bill Neubauer was going to have four recon team members in his, his helicopter. And we were going to insert these guys about a half a click, a half a kilometer, from the demilitarized zone into a hover hole, a 100-foot hole in the jungle that we were going to drop them off, and then the other helicopter was going to drop his four guys off, and then we were going to fly away. We had two gunships on stations, and they had machine guns, and they had uh, 2.75-inch rockets. And we had two F-4 Phantom jets at 20,000 feet, just in case, just for cover. So that sets the scene. I briefed my gunner and crew chief, who both had M60s, that, to start opening fire when we came over the, the hover hole and started going down to drop off the, the recon team members, because we wanted to keep the enemy's head down if he was there. Excuse me. I briefed the uh, gunships to do a daisy chain on either side to fire the rockets into the uh, uh, jungle on either side as we were going down into the hover hole. So I flew low level and came up into the opening, which is probably big enough to, for maybe one and a half, two helicopters. It was too tight for two helicopters. And I told my gunner and crew chief to start firing. So they start firing their M60 uh, machine guns. And I dropped down 100 feet and land the four recon team members get out, and then the gunner and crew chief said, you're clear, sir, we can go. We went up the 100 feet. I accelerated, climbed to 1,500 feet, which is the altitude to avoid small arms fire. And once I hit 1,500 feet, I heard on the radio Bill, uh, Bill uh, the other pilot, going, receiving fire, receiving fire. And I threw my helicopter into a 90 degree turn and I looked down and I could see Bill's helicopter was surrounded in, just in a hail of green tracer rounds. Now green tracers are sort of what the enemy is with their AK-47s. And uh, I said, Bill, you okay? He said, it's hotter than the goddamn hornet's nest down there, Randy. He said, and the enemy has your men pinned down. Well, let me say something about being a hero. No one sets out to be a hero. It's just normal people in extraordinary circumstances. And that's what this was. This was a normal, uh, a, a normal guy, me, in an extraordinary circumstance. And I put those guys in there. It was up to me to get them out. So I briefed my gunner and crew chief. I briefed Bill to tell the uh, gunships to uh, offer suppressor fire on either side as I went in. I did a low-level approach. I could see the four recon team members on their stomachs firing into the enemy. Uh, there was a dead uh, Vietnamese soldier in the landing zone. And every once in a while, you could see bullets hitting around them. I descended. The uh, gunner and crew chief opened up with their uh, M60s. And there's shell casings going everywhere off the back of my helmet. And you could smell that uh, expended gunpowder. The heat, the, the scratchiness of the um, um, Nomex flight suit, the heaviness of the 25 pound um, chest protector that we wore for bullets. Landed. Two of the re recon team members started running backwards, firing into the ridge line, and they immediately got onto our helicopter. The other two guys started uh, running backwards, and uh, one of the fellas got. Uh, grabbed his leg and went down. He'd obviously been shot. 
uh, his buddy grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and pulled him into the helicopter, and so he threw him on the helicopter, and all four guys were on board. And they said, okay, come on, let's go. Uh, I didn't mention I had an FNG co-pilot next to me. You know what FNG is? The two uh, words are new guy. Think friggin', <laughs> but it's in the military. I had an FNG, a fucking new guy with me. He's a first lieutenant, his eyeballs were like this. Anyway, so we start pulling up, and I'd refueled in Quang Tree before this mission, so I was heavy. And as you know, with helicopters, it's easy to come down and drop off some a weight, but when you're heavy, to come straight up, especially 100 feet with the humidity and everything that was um, there was that day, it was going to be difficult. I could tell we were heavy, maybe too heavy. So I pick it up, and we start coming up 20, 25, 30, 30 feet, and uh, the gunner and crew chief are firing the. Um, Gunships on either side are doing a, a round robin daisy chain, and I could feel the concussion of the uh, M79 rockets. Just boom, boom, boom. I could feel it through the controls. I could feel the impact of it on the aircraft. 45, 50, 55 feet were ex uh, ascending. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm too heavy. Are we going to make it out of this uh, landing zone? 50 feet. 55, 60 feet, we stop at 75 feet. All my engine instruments are in the red lines. I pull up a little bit more collective pitch level to try to go up, and it droops the rotor. I get the whoop, whoop, whoop in the low, in lower rotor RPM audio in my headset, and we start to descend. We're, we're losing lift. So we're hovering there at about 70 feet. Everything's in the red line, and I can't go up one more foot. My, my FNG co-pilot turns to me and said, get out of here. I said, I'm trying. I'm trying. Co-pilot, uh, the um, crew chief says, sir, my gun's jammed. The, um, the uh, gunner is still firing. The guys in the back are still firing, the um, um, recon team members. I see two silver streaks on either side of me. It's the F-4s. They drop their sortie of napalm. Woof, woof. A wall of heat and light, of jelly gasoline. It's just a wall of fire. I can feel the heat of it. I see the light of it. And we're just hovering there. It's 70 feet. Just hovering there. Now, the enemy must have realized that we were in trouble because we were hovering there. And I looked through my chin bubble, and I saw one of the Vietnamese soldiers run out, and he's aiming at me with an M, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, AK-47. Luckily, one of the recon team members saw him in the back. He pulled a pin on a grenade, threw it down on there, and blew that guy up into the jungle. But we're hovering there, just hovering. And what's odd in situations like this is how everything tunnels in. And I remember, this is odd, but, but I remember the squiggly salt um, sweat left over on my Ray-Ban sunglasses as we're hovering there, as we're hovering there. One of the elements of crew resource management is using all the available resources available to you to affect a safe outcome. I was running out of ideas, and then I remembered something that one of the old guys said before he left Vietnam. One of the old guys, he was about 23. He said, Randy, if you're ever in a situation like this where you, get in, where you need power, and if you just need a little bit of power to get you out of a tight situation, put in right pedal. If you do that, it takes pitch out of the tail rotor blades. They're taking less bite out of the air. It may deliver more shaft horsepower to your main rotor. You're going to spin, but you'll be able to go up. I was out of ideas. I didn't have anything else to do, so I put in right pedal, and we started spin. And we made it that last 25 feet to accelerate down the mountain slope to safety. Twelve minutes later, I'd taken this guy who had been shot in the leg to the 22nd Surgical Hospital in Fubai. And um, I was told days later that the uh, bullet had nicked his femoral artery. And had we not taken him to that surgical hospital in an expeditious manner, he would have died. So. Three things I received from that 
mission. I learned about CRM when I didn't even know it existed. It hadn't been invented. It wouldn't be invented for another eight years. Using all the available resources available to me to affect a safe outcome. I learned that the helicopter could save lives by getting a wounded soldier to the hospital quickly. And I also received this distinguished flying cross for doing that. Now, fast forward to 1979, 10 years later, when I became uh, a, unwittingly, a pioneer in helicopter EMS in the States. Herman Hospital in Houston had three Alouette three helicopters. And um, I was one of six ex-Vietnam helicopter pilots that were trying to prove the concept to a doubting American public and a skeptical medical community that the helicopter could save lives in peacetime like we knew it could in Vietnam. So we were working 72 hours at the hospital, 72 hour shifts. And the only way that we can handle it uh, without being too tired is we, among the three of us, we would do, th with the three helicopters, we had one helicopter pilot per aircraft. We would just see who's the most tired and let him sleep while the rest of us would take the calls and rotate through. FAA didn't do anything. We had duty time um, regs in place, but they didn't do anything to ensure that we got our rest. They were, they were, they were, they were not a help. And, and just like they're not a help now in America, which I'll, I'll uh, touch on later. The FAA is not our friend. And I'm one of the few guys that'll stand up and say that. And probably the next time you'll see me, I'll be on the 10 o'clock news and I'll have <laughs> concrete galoshes or something. But it needs to be said. There's too many people that don't uh, speak up. Anyway, Herman Hospital. So we were trying to prove the concept, and we did. And Herman Hospital became a training base for all the other air medical programs that, you know, these um, uh, program directors, these uh, hospital administrators saw it like a courtesy card to stretch the net to bring in these trauma patients that would generate high bills in their hospital. It was a fact with, a, you know, it's a philanthropic thing, yeah, we're saving lives. And there's a billboard that flies around the city in a 150 mile radius. It's a win-win situation. So we became a training base for all these new programs popping up across the states, and we were passing along a bad gene. Because we would say, yeah, this is how you do it. You push the weather so that you've proved to the hospital that you're giving it the old college try. We were told by our company, Rocky Mountain Helicopters, at least the helicopter to the hospital, we don't care if it's close to zero, zero. You've got to take off, do a tight turn, and land at the, heli uh, the hospital helipad just to show that you're giving it the try. Even though, professionally, we knew that there was no way we were going to make this flight. But we had to show the customer. And the customer ended up having an influence on decisions made in the cockpit. It's still happening today. And it's dangerous. I was sent a year later from um, Herman Hospital to set up the UCSD Medical Center Life Flight Program. Uh, we started with a long ranger, you know, VFR, no autopilot or anything. And we fly, flew everything from the desert to the East County to 6,000 foot mountains to the, um, the coastal area that was, uh, we were clamped in, clamped in by the marine layer, you know, the marine layer that comes in at night, you know. It's about 1,700 feet, goes up to about three or 4,000 feet. It's cloud layer, and then it butts into the higher terrain as it goes eastbound, so that we couldn't get to the East County uh, if we were called for a, uh, uh, like a medevac. Now, <laughs> we had this madman named Bill Bax, who was the medical director. And uh, I had a little trick. I don't know, I might like to pass it along to you, but we're in an alouette. Have you ever seen an Alouette 3? It's an exercise and induced drag. You know, if you wanted to make a helicopter that was unaerodynamic, just take the plans from an Alouette 3. And what you did is there's this little pitch indicator there, and you, looked, you set this dial, and 
whatever the temperature was, that was your density altitude, and then this dot pitch dial, you pull it up to a little chevron, and that's as fast as you could go. And usually it was about 100, 110 knots. And he'd say, Randy, this patient is really sick. If there's any way that you can make this thing go any faster, it could make the difference. Well, this is an alouette, so you know what I'd do? I'd lower it at about 500 feet altitude, and I opened the vent, and I stuck my face in the wind, and my hair was going back, and I'm leaning forward, and we're low, and I'd always get back to the hospital and he'd say, thanks, Randy, it made all the difference. <laughs> and I never told him. <laughs> I never told him that trick, that it was just an illusion. We became the first hospital-based IFR program in America in 1982. We set it up. And we had a Bell 222. It was the A model. How many pilots are here? How many? You know how you should never fly the A model of any aircraft? You know, that's the first one. This thing, we went through 10 engines in 10 months. Can you imagine? You know, here you are, a patient at the hospital, and you see this engine get winched up the side of the hospital, you know, rotor blades. And you know, I'd probably better just sit in here and keep me off that helicopter. Yeah, the engine was the LTS-101. They made it for tanks. And the people that made it for tanks didn't get the contract, so they said, where are we going to put the engine? So how about put it in a helicopter? And that's what they did. And it was a bad idea. It's a good engine now, but it wasn't then. Anyway, so to get my rating in the 222, I had to go to flight safety in Fort Worth. And I met a guy named David Sutcliffe. David would be the guy that is the reason for me standing in front of you today. And this was back in 1982. He changed my life. David was an ex-British Navy helicopter pilot. And he, whenever there's an, a new aircraft, pilots from all over the world that buy that aircraft go to flight safety. And they learn, you know, about, we did the flight simulator and ground school. And I, that's where I met David. And we became good friends. And David came to stay with me at the pilot's quarters one time. And I had three night flights, and he couldn't believe that I was flying in this weather. He said, mate, he's British, mate, if we ever get an opening in, in Oman, where he was flying, in the Sultanate of Oman with the Royal Oman Police, we'll give you a call and, and we'll ask you to put your CV in to get you out of this, because this is dangerous. I almost lost my life five times flying air medical in the six years I did it. Twice going inadvertent IMC, and three times going inadvertent IMC, and twice um, almost landing to uh, a, a beautifully laid out flare pattern at night with crisscross wires overhead. And so that sounded real good, going to Oman, this new job. And so, true to his word, uh, after flying at UCSD for a while, uh, he emailed me, not email, we didn't have email then, he called me. And he said, we have this opening. There's 122 applicants, we have nine, nine um, applicants for three jobs. So I had to fly to England to the Royal Albert Hall for the interview. And I was going to do or say anything to get this job. And in, in, in the meantime, I was awarded the first annual Golden Hour Award for my personal um, contribution to, to furthering the air medical um, standards in America. And he saw that as an opportunity. If they could hire me to come to the Sultanate of Oman and set up a, a countrywide air medical program, that would be an asset for them. Because the Sultan had just purchased two $1 million EMS kits for their Bell 214 STs, of which they had six. A Bell 214 ST is a 20 place, twin engine helicopter, olive weight of 17,500 pounds. But nobody knew anything about EMS, so I was like a candidate for that. Now, the interview. In the interview at the Royal Albert Hall, like I said, I was going to do or say anything to get that job because air medical flying back in the States was dangerous. And I wanted, I, and the responsibility I had. I was being paid as much as the guy stocking milk at the grocery store. 
And I was living on a sailboat at the time, and I was making not very much money. I wanted to go sailing one day. I couldn't save enough money. I could see going to the Middle East and saving tax-free money was a good way to do this. Even after having flown in, I was a Bell helicopter instructor in Iran just before the revolution. I said, that's it. I'm never going to go back to the Middle East after being kicked out of that country. The interview. You know, they were very polite. Uh, there were three senior ranking uh, Royal Amman police um, officers there. They were all ex-British military. And they asked me a question that completely, have you ever had a job interview and they ask you a question and you might as well be standing on the carpet and they pulled it out from under you? They asked me what I'd done in Vietnam and I said, well, we used to pull these guys out of the jungle on, on strings called Maguire rigs, 150 foot long ropes and we'd carry them 60 miles from Laos back to Vietnam and land them. And he said, well, would you be willing, and this is the question he asked me that just completely floored me, would you be willing, if asked, to fly two pilots in one of our Bell 205s to a neighboring country with the SAS in the back using night vision goggles, this is in 1984, night vision goggles, land on a foreign embassy uh, to rescue diploma diplomats? I'm thinking to myself real quick, okay. Yemen, <laughs> Saudi Arabia, across the Strait of Hormuz, there's Iran, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Qatar. I looked at him with my best John Wayne poker face and said, yes, sir, I'd be willing to do that. Let me tell you what I was thinking. Fuck no! <laughs> Sorry about the F-bomb, but, you know, I'd already been kicked out of one country in Iran during the revolution. There was gunfire in the streets. The only way we knew what was going on at the time was by listening to BBC radio and shortwave radio. I didn't want to do it, anything like that again. So, but I wanted that job. That's how badly I wanted out of air medical flying. So I said, yes, sir, I'd be willing to do that. I got the job. In the six years that I was flying at Air Medical back in the States, there were 15 fatal accidents killing 36 people. And that was in the early days when there weren't that many helicopters. I call my experience leaving Air Medical flying in the States, departing Plato's Cave. Have you ever heard of Plato's Cave? There's an allegory of Plato's cave, and it's, a, and it's, a, um, it's sort of a throwback from that, where people are chained to the wall of the cave, and there's a fire behind them, and their perception of reality are the shapes that they see on the wall. But there's a corollary to that. And what it is, is it, what's your first name? Chris and I are in the cave. We've got all of Maslow's hierarchy of needs met. We've got food, water, shelter, community, law. I was at the Mayo Clinic talking and I said we got sex and water sex and then the head of the Mayo Clinic came up to me after we just said, where's that cave? <laughs> so, so Chris and I are there and we said, you know what? We see this hole up there, I wonder what's up there. Because we're sort of adventuresome, soul, adventuresome souls. Maybe there's something better up there. So Chris and I tell our friends about it, and they, and they all sort of poo-poo it. They say, well, why would you want to go up there? There's not, how could there be anything better than this? So we can see we're getting nowhere, so we, so we conspire that at night we're going to sneak out of the cave. That's what happened when I left Air Medical Flying and took that job with the Royal Amman Police. First of all, instead of just being just the pilot, I was treated with respect. I was uh, elevated to the rank of major in the Royal Oman Police. We were never, ever, ever questioned on any decision we made in the cockpit. And we flew every type of mission a helicopter could do except for sp spray, spraying chemicals. We, we did just about everything you could do. 
And what I learned was what I would eventually bring back to America. And the reason I'm standing here, even though I'm in Canada, it's the reason I came back and became an activist is before what I saw th working with the British. They were all ex-British military pilots. There were 18 of them. They were all ex-North Sea pilots used to hard IFR flying. I was used to single pilot IFR, taking everything on myself, flying in the clouds by myself with an autopilot back in 1982. And now it took me six months to learn how to, de to delegate some of the tasks to this asset who's sitting next to me, this other pilot, and to use good crew resource management and good two crew operations. And I thought early on, you know what? This would really work to save lives back in America where it, I can see it's probably gonna be one of the most dangerous jobs there is out there. I left the cave. Here's where Oman is. You can see all these wonderful countries I'd have to go try to save diplomats. Luckily, I never had to do it. We did train for it and have people fast rope from the helicopters and stuff, but luckily, thank God, we never had to do it. So, in the 13 years, I, I went for two years to Oman. It was such a good deal. That's where Kay, my wife, and I met. She was a nurse at the Royal Hospital there. I was working for the police as a major for the Royal Oman Police. It was such a good deal, I stayed for 13 years. And we call it our golden time. Oman is the best kept secret in the Middle East. The Sultan was educated at Sandhurst in Britain. He loves the West, very tolerant. And it's where I learned this new paradigm, this new way of operating from these ex-North Sea pilots. It was a gift that eventually I would try to come back to America to share, to stop the carnage going on in the, in the EMS industry back home. In the 13 years that I was in Oman, and I still, because I was the first recipient of the Golden Hour Award, I felt sort of an obligation, and I still, believed in the concept of a helicopter air ambulance from what we had in, in Vietnam and how it could see it could save life in America. But it was being mismanaged. And because of the mismanagement, people were dying. And so for every crash, I kept a good eye on what was going on back home. That I was waiting for the people to wake up and finally get it and how to fix it. But they were that baboon caught in that stump that wouldn't let that prize go, which is the bottom line. So 60 HEMS accidents happened over that time, killing 90 more people. I retired from Oman, bought a 42-foot cutter, went sailing for a year. Has anybody retired yet done that? Has anybody ditched school ever? This sheepish hand. You ever notice when you did school, there's nobody to play with? <laughs> That's how it was for me. I was playing tennis with these guys who are probably my age now. Hey, where's Bob? Well, he had a heart attack. What about Jim? Well, he had his foot amputated. What about Bob? Uh, Bob too, we call him. Well, he, he, he had a stroke. Man, playing tennis with you guys is a real bummer. Uh, and so luckily, a friend of mine whom I'd flown in uh, within Oman, which I became the head of training there. And they needed another pilot flying for the King of Saudi Arabia, a Bell 214 ST, 20 place helicopter, 17,500 pound olive weight, twin engine, off the King's yacht. He called me and said, Randy, do you, would you like this job? You only work four and a half months a year. We'll give you an obscene amount of money. I said, Frank, is this a trick question? <laughs> so I did that. And it reaffirmed to me, because these, all those guys, there were five of us, ex-North Sea pilots, good two crew operations, think airline, good crew resource management. These guys were pros. None of us had less than about 10,000 hours. In the three years I worked for Saudi Arabia, of course, 9-11 happened. There were 12 fatal HEMS crashes. 
killing 34 more people. It kept going and going and going. I'm just going, when are they going to get it? Then 9-11 happened. It wasn't really the flavor of the month to be an American in Saudi Arabia. So I took a job with Abu Dhabi Aviation, where they have 160 pilots, 20 nationalities of pilots. We're flying twin, uh, twin engine Bell 412s. They've got 12 139s now. And I became a flight instructor and flight examiner, just like I was in Oman with the British. That's probably the greatest compliment I've ever received in my aviation career, is when the Brits in Oman made me their head of training so that I could pass along what they'd taught me to the new guys coming along and give them check rides every six months. Abu Dhabi Aviation confirmed to me that we were doing it right. Two crew, autopilot, good crew resource management, the way that we should be doing it in America. And I keep watching. I forgot to mention, I forgot to mention, and this is important. In 1985, the first year after I left flying air medical, I got a degree in journalism. I wrote a, a book called The Golden Hour. I wrote it for one reason, not to make a lot of money, not to gain notoriety. I wrote it to say to anyone that would read it back in America, if you keep doing it this way, if you keep doing the same practices this way, more people are going to die. 358 people, the time that happened, let me think, about 250 people had died, leaving about at that time maybe 400 crash survivors. That book had become prophetic. That book had become like reading, looking into a crystal ball of what's going to happen. So there is the frustration. It's like being a, a doctor. The, the Mayo brothers, you know, Charlie and Will Mayo, the Mayo Clinic, they used to go abroad all the time to see how other people did it. And they would bring those procedures back to the Mayo Clinic so that they could save lives without having to reinvent the wheel. Well, that's what when I felt I had done. I'd gone abroad. I've got this, this cure for, for these accidents that keep happening, but nobody's getting it. So I stayed at Abu Dhabi Aviation, and I became a flight simulator instructor and, and uh, flight examiner in the Bell 412 um, Level D simulator in Dubai out of the CAA simulator um, complex. It has 13 different sims that go all the way from 747, Airbus, 777, and then our little 412. That's it on the far right. Who here has been in a simulator? It's a, just a fabulous training device. If I really want to screw with somebody's head as the operator, I don't do anything. Because <laughs> they're expecting their, their life to become unpleasant because you can do things in a flight simulator that you can't do in the real aircraft. So I don't do anything. Well, usually I give them like an engine fire or something like that. But it's still instilling in, my, in me the benefit of having two pilots, the benefit of having an autopilot, the benefit of CRM while watching after writing a, a book about how to do it correctly, back in America, more people die. You know what loft training is? Line organizational flight training where you actually do uh, simulated missions in the simulator? I used to have the guys land on a road at night because we, had a, we ended up, Abu Dhabi Aviation got an uh, uh, air medical program in Saudi Arabia. And I wrote the SOP for it. We had 50 pilots and um, 10 aircraft, a couple of 139s, a couple of 412s, out of Jeddah and Riyadh and Medina and Mecca. I can tell this story. We had to get a couple Muslim pilots because. Uh, Non-Muslims can't operate out of Medina in Mecca. And we had uh, a couple guys that were 
educated in um, South Dakota at a uh, uh, university there. And they were as Western as can be. They were, uh, they were fabulous guys. Good pilots, too, because they were trained at Saudi Aramco. So they had uh, good procedures, good CRM. Uh, they didn't push their own personal limits. They were good. And I had given them an engine fire in the clouds. They dealt with it famously. And they're on the, uh, on the ILS, the instrument landing system. They're at the outer marker. They're probably about 2,000 feet. And they're in the clouds, they're coming down on single engine, and I'd set the cloud base at 500 feet. So they're coming in at about 70 knots, pretty slow, really. So they've got about two minutes or so before they're going to break out of the clouds. And suddenly, Khaled in the left seat, I'm sitting between them, Khaled in the left seat says to Achman, he said, what would happen if we lost the good engine? I thought that was an interesting question. So, and uh, Khaled said, I don't know. And Achman said, well, we'd have 77 virgins. I couldn't contain myself. More than once have I had my alligator mouth overrun my hummingbird rear end. I, I leaned forward and I said, hey, guys, this may be politically incorrect, but with all the blowing up and everything going on in your part of the world, are there any virgins left? But what got them was when I said, and who's to say they're all women? And they went, <laughs> <laughs> the value. I could see a new way of doing it. I'd left the, Chris and I had left the cave. We saw a new way of doing it. But I haven't been back to the cave in 28 years. Then on the 31st of August, 2010, I became an activist because I heard of another air medical crash. I wrote another book called Dear Mom, I'm Alive. And it was about my one year tour in Vietnam and it's been optioned to be made into a movie. And the producer wanted something called high concept, a one sentence description of what that movie or what the book is gonna be about. And he emailed me to say, Randy, you're not going to believe it. There's been another air medical helicopter crash. And I, I went nuts. It was 10 o'clock at night in August. It was like 40 degrees centigrade out. And I flipped. I left my accommodation at Abu Dhabi Aviation. And I walked. I walked. I walked for three miles thinking, when are they going to get it? And what can one man do to affect change? What can I do to affect change? because they don't get it. Chris and I had left the cave. We get it. They don't get it. What can I do? These are the people that died. It was a jet ranger. It went into the clouds, and it came out in five pieces. Inadvertent IMC, where they went into the clouds, instrument meteorological conditions. He lost spatial orientation and lost it. Came out in pieces. And during that walk, those two things kept going through my mind. What can one man do to bring about change? And this scene from a movie called Network, who's seen this movie? It, it came out a long time ago, 1976. But what Peter Finch said was going through my head. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. From outside the cave, I couldn't understand why the medical community, why the American people weren't sticking their head out the window and saying, I am tired of the carnage, do something. I couldn't understand it from outside the cave. And I decided that I was going to try 
to do something because I had the answer. Chris and I had the answer. So I emailed Oprah Winfrey. Honestly, and for some reason, I haven't received a reply. But I just said, give me five minutes. And then I rewrote The Golden Hour. Because when I wrote The Golden Hour, I didn't know about crew resource management. I only knew that we were working 48 hour shifts and dead tired to the point where I couldn't remember the takeoff from the helipad. And people were tired, and, and I reckon that being tired was one of the main reasons that people were killing themselves, you know, to affect their decision making. I rewrote it, and I rewrote it to give him, the protagonist, a way to win that would give the message to anybody who read it, say, yeah, that's what we need to do. And you know what he does? He ends up getting blackballed in America as an air medical helicopter pilot in 1977. And you know who he comes to work for? Stars in Calgary. He's a cowboy, so it worked out perfectly. And he learns a new paradigm by going to Canada, because we need to be doing it like, we, like you do it here. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. We're the only people in the world that do it the way we do it. Everybody else, those 20 nationalities of pilots, 160 pilots that I flew in Abu Dhabi Aviation, when I told them what's going on in the States, they said, you guys are nuts. And I said, you're right. They wouldn't do it. And then I wrote Journey to the Golden Hour, because the Golden Hour was fiction based on fact, because I didn't want to make angry the people that I was, you know, the personalities I was using. So I just used the personalities with different names, changed the names and different um, descriptions. But I had written my autobiography for my um, family. So I took from my diaries and from this, I wrote Journey to the Golden Hour that goes basically from uh, picking up the Vietnam story to the story I've just told you and how I became an air medical pilot. So through, the, through my eyes, the reader could see the dangers and hopefully make change. When I went on this journey on what can one man do to enact change, one of the first speaking engagements I had is where I met Paul Dixon, was at the HAC in, in April 2010. Was it 2010 or 11? 2011. And it was my way of getting on stage to get credibility so that I could hopefully, what I saw myself doing is getting on the stage at one of the yearly air medical transport conference stages and saying, look, what are you doing? You're killing people. And here's the answer. Did you ever see One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with uh, Jack Nicholson? And it's a wonderful movie. And he bets all the inmates that he can pick up this big sink thing. He can pick it up and throw it out the window, and they're all going to go see the World Series on TV at the local bar. And of course, he tries to pick this thing up, and he can't do it. And he disappoints all the inmates. But what he says is the way I was thinking, if I could get on one of those stages. At least I tried. At least I did that. And so. I was invited 13 months after taking that walk in Abu Dhabi to be a speaker in St. Louis at the Air Medical Transport Conference in front of 700 people. And honest to God, Kay and I thought that I was going to find out where Jimmy Hoffa was buried. Because what I had to say was a whole new paradigm that the people were not going to like because it meant that they were going to it was going to affect their bottom line if it got changed, if that idea ever took off. But it was an idea that would save lives if they ever got tired of killing people. To drive home the point, I had the name of every person that had died in an air medical helicopter since I wrote The Golden Hour. It took me six hours sitting at my, at my uh, coffee table on my couch and cutting out each individual name. It was like putting each name to a final resting place. And whenever I feel kind of downhearted about whether I'm, I'm making a difference, Kay reminds me that I am the voice for the voiceless. 
I tucked an individual name in 358 business envelopes. And Kay and volunteers from the National EMS Pilots Association passed them out to the people coming into the uh, conference hall. They had no idea what they, were, what they had. And at the end of my 50-minute talk, I asked the people with envelopes to please stand up and told them that inside each envelope was an individual name of people who had died in an air medical helicopter since I wrote. But look around. Look how many people are standing. Look how many people we've lost. Please join me, like Peter Finch, and say, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Thank you very much. One of my pilot friends said that was just a cheap way to get a standing ovation. <laughs> But it was a moment. And people came up to us and afterwards with tears in their eyes saying, thank you for saying what's needed to be said for the last 20 years. They were desperate for an answer. I gave it to them. And I didn't think it would go any farther than that. And now, it's gone to where we were, in, we were flown to Australia last August because some of the Australians that attended this conference and the conference in Seattle where I, the year later after I uh, spoke about CRM because it's uh, just been mandated for the, um, uh, the air medical uh, side of the aviation section that they all have to go through CRM. We've been invited, we're going to Rome in June. And what's weird is that the people that are doing it right are the people that want to hear the message. And I said to the people in Australia, why do you want to hear this? They need to be doing it in America. They said, because it reaffirms in our mind that we're doing it right. The people in Australia, you know what they're doing? They're going to part 121. You know what that is? Airline standards. Two crew, night vision goggles, autopilot, no influence from the medical people at all in the cockpit, and no landing to unprepared landing sites that haven't been wrecked during the day. I didn't know, after being gone for 28 years, I didn't know what the political side was happening in America. And then I realized 2008 was the worst year we had ever in air medical. They lost something like 34 people, and I can't remember how it crashes. And finally, the NTSB till the FAA fix it. And they had a four-day um, meeting with all the stakeholders. How, how do we fix it? And you wouldn't believe, I, it's online. This, the final report written by Randy Babbitt, who was then the head of the FAA, said that 2008 was the most deadly year they had in EMS. And the four-day public hearing was called to critically examine safety issues concerning this industry. You know what they said? The witnesses testified that instrument flight training that leads to proficiency in instrument meteorological conditions enhances the pilot ability to fly safely at night and in VFR conditions, but said they were reluctant to require the use of these devices out of concern that some smaller HEMS operators could be forced out of business. So what does that say? You're putting a cost to a human life. So you know what I say, don't complain that people are dying if you're not gonna do anything about it. And here, dual pilot autopilot use. This is from the NTSB, this is from the stakeholders. A, view, a review of the NTSB aviation accident database revealed that during the eight year period from 2000 to 208, 2008, 123 HEMS accidents occurred, killing 104 people and seriously injuring 42 more. In some capacity, these were attributed as a probable cause 
in 60 of the 123 accidents, the pilot action over or omissions. Mo sorry, most of these 60 accidents might have been prevented had a second pilot or an autopilot been installed. This is what the FAA found out in that four-day meeting. And it says, in the absence of a second pilot, a use of an autopilot might, uh, might enhance a pilot's ability to cope with high workloads such as inadvertent IMC. Are any of you aware that the FAA just came out with 13 new rules? Because they were supposed to come out three years ago. 34 people would have died waiting for these rules that have taken five years. In those 13 rules, nine apply to helicopter EMS. You know how many rules mention autopilot or uh, dual pilot? Even after that four day meeting to say, we could have saved half the people's lives. I feel I'm stuck in an alternate reality because they've come up with their own way to fix the problem and they're not doing it. And then I did some further checking. In the Aviation Law Monitor in August 2012, this says it all. When the FAA was created, it was charged with both regulating aviation and promoting it. The FAA's inherent conflict of interest explains why the FAA is so, also often ignores the NTSB's aviation safety recommendations. You know what that tells me? The FAA is broken. Our FAA is broken. And I'm going to give you a grim prediction. You're not going to see a reduction in uh, HEMS accident rates. I need a, one of those lanyards with this thing around my neck. It uh, like grows legs. So, and then after that came out, if it can hand, happen to Andy Olson, it can happen to anybody. Andy Olson lost his life four days from, uh, four shifts from retirement on the 12th of December, 2012. He was 23 years in the military as a helicopter pilot, 19 years as a HEMS pilot. And his last transmission in, in snow, in a snowstorm, was we're turning around due to weather in a vocal with no autopilot. I, I emailed the head of uh, the uh, Air Medical Society and said to Rick Sherlock, I said, Rick, if it can happen to him, it can happen to anybody. Expect to see more crashes. Loss in control is one of the largest reasons that we have HEMS accidents. There should be no HEMS, out there, HEMS aircraft out there in America without an autopilot, period. And the financial considerations should never come into overruling flight safety. Because you're doing so, you're putting a value on a human life. This is where the golden opportunity comes in. Last year, last March, the FAA finally woke up and said, you know what? 80% of all accidents have an element of human error. So what if we're not giving the pilot all the tools? Sending a pilot VFR at night in marginal weather is like going to battle with a bow and arrow. So let's have the pilot and the crew realize what their action or inaction has on the safe operation of the flight. That is what I call the AMRAM mantra. That is the high concept of AMRAM that I came up with so that I could explain to a 12-year-old that knew nothing about aviation, what is CRM? What is AMRAM, Air Medical Resource Management? Well, it's a stakeholder's knowledge of how their action or their inaction affects the safe outcome of the flight. And you can see an overbearing medical director can have a, a, an op, a, a, a negative effect on the decision making in the cockpit because of the pressure it's putting on the pilot. Got to get those patients. Got to fatten the bottom line. We're low on calls. 
to the flight nurse that says, you know, I gotta get home. I have a recital, my daughter has a recital I need to go to. I know you're not happy with the weather, but let's give it a try. It's the knowledge that a stakeholder has on how do my actions affect the safe or inaction safe, the, the effect, safe effect of this flight. I saw a golden opportunity. I'd been a CRM, I'd been involved with CRM for, oh, since 1982. Last year, we had five helicopter EMS crashes, three of them fatal, leaving nine medical crew members uh, and one patient dead and seven injured. Back in 2009, the NTSB made 10 recommendations to the FAA to improve safety for HEMS flight crews that include better training, use of night vision imaging, and requiring autopilots if a second pilot is not available. That was June of last year. And they're, they're bringing it up. This was before the rules uh, came out this year. So. What could you do? If the FAA won't act to try to make those aircraft as safe as possible, and let me tell you something. When we were in Australia, I just about got up and did a fist pump in their conference because they said, the reason that we're going to part 121 standards is because our patients do not have the ability to decide what level of risk that we put them into. So we're gonna give them the safest helicopter we possibly can. I just wanted to jump up and holler. And here's the thing, 90% of the operators in Australia are already 121 compliant. So, if the FAA won't give us the tools to be safe if we inadvertently go into the clouds, what can we do? CRM. And this montage, it's an 11-minute montage, come from my course to give you an idea of some of the things in a typical CRM course. And I, if you're not having fun in a CRM course, you're doing it wrong. It's relaxed. You need everybody to contribute because in a crew resource management course, they found out in the airline, sitting in front of a computer does not change behavior. The only way for behavior to change as adults is for us to come up with the idea ourselves. I attended a, a, a CRM course just as an observer at American Airlines last December to see if I was doing it right. And luckily I am. Because I looked for a train the trainer course here in, in America. You know how many I found? Where did I have to go? I asked the guys at Abu Dhabi Aviation, where's a world-class train the trainer course for a CRM instructor, they said, without doubt, uh, global air training in Cheshire, England. So I did that. I went there for a week, and it was the most intense week I've ever had in my life. Anyway, this is the montage. I hope you enjoy it. But it looks like Give me a few more minutes. I've already waited too long. Here we go. No, we don't. Get off of Human error. We put a lot of faith in technology. I do. I get into airplanes, one of those wonderful inventions. But guess what? They keep dropping out of the skies. And almost always the reason is human error. It makes me laugh when I hear engineers say, oh, we've got a foolproof technology, don't worry about it. Wait a minute, by definition, a foolproof technology is a technology free of fools. 
Who among us has never fallen in love and lost 50 IQ points, caught the flu or went to a party and got drunk, come into work the next day? We are all fools at some point in our lives. There is no such thing as a foolproof technology. Humans, we mean well, but we're imperfect creatures living in a beautifully imperfect world. Sometimes the little things get us, and other times, the not so little. It's amazing we've made it this far. For a number of years now, work has been proceeding in order to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a transmission that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. Such an instrument is the turbo encapsulator. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it is produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of prefamulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fan. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal lotus o delta type placed in panendermic semi-boloid slots of the stator, every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremie pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the grammys. The turbo encabulator has now reached a high level of development and it's being successfully used in the operation of Novertrunians. Moreover, whenever a fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be employed in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal replenition. It's not cheap, but I'm sure the government will buy it. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. 
And so, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sink. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? Shaping up to be a rough commute out there today. Watch for an accident on the 101 near Sherman Way. And we're just getting word that the 405 southbound has been shut down completely. Looks like some sort of police activity has kind of cleared for a two-mile stretch from the 118 all the way up to Victory. As soon as we get more information, we'll let you know. But in the meantime, we'll get you through with another 40 minutes of your favorite hits on KPP. Girls, now this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her roll! <laughs> so this is easier. Yeah, we can handle this, okay?
Splendidly. Speed it up a little! <laughs> okay. I call that when you're flying, the water level comes up like that. You know, you can just feel that any more water, you're just going to lose it, like Lucy. Um, I quit my job with Abu Dhabi Aviation last year when the, um, when the FAA mandated that all Part 135 operators had to have CRM training because it's my way to going back and making a difference. I quit the, I quit the job at Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Aviation. It was a lucrative job. It was relatively easy. I had it pretty well weighed off with no place to go, just the idea. I just had the idea that I wanted to try to make a difference in air medical flying in the States to try to save lives by teaching crew resource management. We met a guy at the Seattle conference, air medical conference, named Jack Tudero. And he said, hey, how you doing, uh, Kay and Randy? We, he saw us at the HAC a couple years earlier. What are you doing? I told him what we were doing. I quit my job at Abu Dhabi Aviation. I want to make a difference. So Oregon Aero, this is an advertisement for the Mike Dennis, the guy who owns the company. Because he believes in saving lives by designing aircraft seats for almost every military aircraft out there. He designs it so people won't get hurt as badly by using those seats. And he said, this is a fabulous opportunity to save lives, and hopefully they won't need our seats. So they've taken me on, and they said, we will pay for you to fly anywhere to do the job. You just ask a daily fee, get the people to put you up, put you in a hotel, and that'll be the deal. We don't want one penny. And I think that Mike deserves recognition for that uh, being so philanthropic. So that's my connection. I don't really work for them. They just sponsor me. They fly me around to do these uh, uh, programs and classes. So. You know my story now. You know how I got to where I am now, to be standing in front of you to try to make a difference in the air medical sector in the States. And uh, I just hope that you wish me luck. If I can save one life, it'll have all been worth it. Thank you very much for taking the time to come listen to me today. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Well, that's very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Great. It says Ferry Autopilot on it. I don't know. What... No, that's fabulous. Is it the game? Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. That's great. That's very nice, thank you. Okay. Just uh, turn it off. That worked out pretty good time-wise, huh? I do.